Hey, everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about Flexbox. So the slide deck is, uh, my name's Estelle, and my GitHub is Estelle, because there aren't that many people named Estelle under the age of 80. <laughs> and I hear there aren't that many web, female web developers over the age of 80, so I get my, dom I get my name sometimes. So today we're going to talk about Flexbox uh, WTF. I don't know what you thought WTF meant, but it means wonderfully terrific features. But we are going to cover some what the fucks. Um, and also, we're going to have unicorns. And a few kittens. That way, it's a technical talk, and we're all good. Um, a little bit about me, because the reason I do this is because I'm a Twitter whore, and I want you guys to follow me on Twitter. Um, and if you look at the book on the way left, I'm in the middle of writing that. So it's the definitive guide. So I read the spec, and I'm going to explain to you the spec so you don't have to read the spec, because it is a yawner. Um, so what problem does Flexbox solve? Uh, Flexbox solves a lot of problems, but I think the main one that we really like is the headache of the multiple column layout with all of the columns being of equal height. Uh, it was actually really easy to solve with, um, with CSS if you like CSS, but someone called it crappy style sheets this morning. Um, and that is the opinion of some people. And they are completely wrong. But, um, but now, look at this. This is two lines uh, that made these three columns the same um, height. And we could have made them uh, fall into place much nicer. Uh, you know, it depends what you want your layout to look like. But that is how easy Flexbox is, a three-column layout, equal height, equal width, with two lines of code. So a uh, big whoop de doo This is about six lines of CSS to get um, a home page layout. So notice the module. First of all, there's the, uh, the navigation. It's on the top right here. It will switch to the bottom when we are on a um, mobile device or narrow mode. And those three buttons are all lined up on the bottom with no absolute positioning. And about six lines of, um, of uh, CSS. Here's the mobile version of that page. It's actually not a mobile version. I, it's a completely different version of the page. I'm cheating a little bit. But notice the navigation right there above the footer. I didn't have to change the underlying HTML. I just changed, uh, put in one media query. In this case right here, where we have our kittens, because you have to have kittens, um, I have all these divs that are all the same height. This row is all the same height, the height of the tallest one. And these are all the same height, also the height of the tallest one. Notice that they're a bit taller. If I change the width um, and make this narrower, they shrink a little bit, and then they pop. And they shrink, and they pop. And I'm always nicely lined up right there. That's about five lines of Flexbox. Um, and there are no media queries. It just dropped when it wanted to drop. So I use min and max width. Simple solution to what used to be a really complex problem. And then the most hated thing of all, which is the sticky footer and sticky header. Sticky header is not the most hated. The sticky footer is. We're going to pretend this is a mobile device, and we're going to Increase the font size so that it actually looks like there. And the footer is going to um, stay at the bottom. Right? So I have a sticky footer. Again, one line, three lines of CSS. So let's go back to this and make it a bit bigger, and then go on to the next one. Um, in here in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little uh, circle on each one of these. Those are links to the actual a document that is in this page, so that when you click on this, you can actually play with it if you're playing along at home. And then this one, a button with three parts. This is an inline flex item, nicely centered, and the height as tall as it needs to be to fit the text on the right, and everything's nicely centered. Again, just a few lines of CSS. So let's learn that CSS. Oh, let's not yet. Let's talk about browser support. Um, browser support is. Nicely green, um, except IE. Pretty soon I don't have to say that anymore. I hear rumor that IE is not supported anymore. So we're talking about Edge. 
Um, so IE11 does support it, IE10 does support it with um, an older version of Microsoft, uh, of MS prefix. Um, and then Android 3, uh, 4.3 or earlier does support it as well. There was this old syntax, uh, which you might want to use for your old Android. I'm not going to cover it, but I kept it in the deck just in case uh, you have a PM who's an idiot and wants you to support devices that are like six years old. Um, there's the IE only version, and this is not, let's not blame IE. We can blame Internet Explorer. We could blame them for everything that they ever did wrong. This is not one of them. They implemented the 2012 spec, and the spec was completely rewritten. So we are now at the final Flexbox version. Um, is it final? It's in candidate recommendation mode, and it went into recommendation mode on January 5th, and all of the browsers have implemented it. There's you know, still a few quirks that were changing like a few months ago. Um, in fact, I had to redo the whole deck. Um, but uh, it, seems to be, it seems to be there. So how easy is it? I didn't show you any code yet, so here's our first line of code. This is a navigation bar. And um, all I have to do is say display flex. I can actually get rid of these three things. Um, and it still looks like a navigation bar. And if I want it to be a prettier navigation bar, um, I can just say uh, flex auto, and each one will take up as much room as it's allowed to take up, and we're good. How hard was that? OK, so not really. I'm going to show you one more example, and then we're going to dive into some properties and values. So here is the, uh, uh, the holy grail layout. You have the header, the footer, the, and then you have the main area with the article, navigation, and a side. I basically say, on the body, display it flex. On the main, display it flex. So you can have a flex container inside another flex container. So the body is displayed um, as a flex container. And then one of the flex items inside of it, which is the main, is also a flex container. And it has three elements inside, the navigation, the article, and the aside. And they line up nicely. If I had 40 lines of code in one, two lines of code or markup in the next, and a large image on the third one, it would be the height that it needed to be. And I could actually say, take the, the minimum width that you need, or to take the maximum width, or make this one larger and these two smaller. And I'm going to show you all of that. I just wanted to show you how easy it was before we got started. So now we are getting started. So we have, um, there's basically five steps. You have to create the f something. You have to con create something into a flex container. And then once you have a flex container, all of its children are flex items. Um, then you set the direction or the flex flow, which is the flex direction and whether it can wrap. So which direction you want to go up uh, top to bottom or left to right or right to left or bottom to top if you want to. Um, alignment, you can say that you want the uh, elements to be stretched across or you want them to be on the left, on the right, on the top, on the bottom, or aligned in the center. Ordering, you can actually say, I want the seventh element to come in second. Um, and then flexibility, you saw in those examples, I'm sorry, my voice, I'm sick. Um, I'm going to move this. <laughs> um, then the flexibility, you saw in that one example where I said take as much space like based on content versus make them all three lined up. Um, that's the flexibility of the items. So let's uh, cover some of these. These are the properties we're going to cover today. Display, I'm not going to read it. You guys can all read English. Um, there's a few that are kind of weird on there. There's minimum height and min width um, and display. And those are already three properties that you know about. They've been around for a really long time. Display, we have two new values. And min width and min height, when it comes to flex items, it has a different default value. So that's why they're here. So the first step is to create a flexible container. And we do that by saying either display flex or display inline flex. All of my examples were display flex, except for the button with the three options inside, where you the check and then agree, and then you're signing the life away for no apparent reason. Um, those were, um, that was the only one that was display inline flex. Um, what's nice, though we don't really need this anymore, is you can actually use CSS as a modernizer um, to say, hey, does my browser support uh, flex? And uh, the CSS for that here, can I use prefix list flex box? is not going to show me. So I basically did an at supports. 
And it's tiny, and I think everyone in the back row likes tiny text. It basically says, do you support display block? If yes, make it red. That way you know it supports uh, uh, um, the display, the support, at supports, rather. And then I said, at supports, display flex. If it does, make the body green. So you can actually use CSS um, kind of like a modernizer. And that's a little bit of a wonderful, terrific, wonderfully terrific feature um, in CSS that few people use. But you can actually use the at supports. Um, and I'm on the wrong deck. It's right there. OK. So you can use CSS kind of as um, a modernizer. OK. So display property, we have display flex. And we have display inline flex. Um, I can say flex 200 pixels. And that didn't work, because I put a mistake right there. Uh, there. Um, so there, I'm basically saying, make them all 200 pixels. Uh, the, it is actually overflowing its container, because the container only needs to be the size. When it's inline flex, it only needs to be the size of the element's default value, not the flex basis. That will come into play later on. But basically, we have display flex and display inline flex. Do I need to reiterate that, or did everyone get those two new values? We're good. OK. Again, this is display inline flex. If I had said flex, we would have had that. And if I didn't use any of them, this is actually what I did. I created a div with a checkbox, uh, a label, rather, with a checkbox, an H1 that says agree, and um, a paragraph that had the, uh, the label. OK. OK. So what exactly is a flex item? I said any child of an element that has flex, uh, display flex or display inline flex. And by any child, it includes generated content. So if you create um, a flex container, the uh, before and the after will actually be a flex item. Any child node will become a flex item as long as um, if it's absolutely or a uh, fixed position, it has a few of the features, but it's basically not. For the sake of understanding how to lay out your page, it's not really a flex item. Um, uh, first letter and first line have no impact. Comments and white space have no impact. But if you actually have a text node that is not inside a child element, it's its own text node, as long as it's not empty, it will become what they call an anonymous flex item. And you can style it. It will be styled exactly like we are styling all of our flex items, but there's no way to target it um, because it's not inside a DOM node. Um, did I say everything? Yep. OK. Then there's a few properties in CSS that behave differently when they are on um, when, it, when it has to do with Flexbox. Uh, the first one is margin. Adjacent margins, we all know adjacent margins collapse. So if you have a top margin of 10 pixels and a bottom margin of 10 pixels, it'll be 10 pixels. It won't be 20. When it comes to flex items, it will actually be 20. It does not collapse. Min width and min height, according to the CSS 2.1 specification, has a default value of 0. In When something is a flex item, its default min width is actually auto. So it's the size of the content. Um, Visibility collapse, I'm going to cover that later. It's just interesting what it does. Then there's some properties that are ignored. Let's say you have columns on, you know, like you have this content and there's columns. It just ignores the columns. It's no longer in, you know, like you have a div and you have content. That will just become an anonymous flex item. It will not have columns. Um, float, clear, uh, both of these, so if you actually want something to work in IE6, again, because you have a really stupid PM who's making you spend hours and hours uh, being backwards compatible, um, can you tell that I've had bad PMs? Um, float and clear are really good fallbacks. So you can actually still make things work in really old browsers if you need to, because when they ignore the flex, they will not ignore float and clear. But if they are supporting um, flex, they will um, ignore float and clear. And then vertical align also um, has no impact because we have better features than vertical align. So the first thing you want to declare is flex flow, which is the flex, oh, after display flex or flex inline flex, you wanted to do the direction 
and the wrapping, which is the flex flow property. It's flex flow property is shorthand for flex direction and flex wrap. The spec authors really want us to use flex flow. I don't use flex flow. I find it much easier to use flex direction and flex wrap. Don't tell them I said that. They'll hate me. Um, but I think I'm being recorded, so now they know. Um, default uh, value is row, but there's also row reverse, column, and column reverse. So let's look at this in action. Here we have column reverse. Um, the order is one, two, three. I made it simple for you guys because I think everyone knows how to count to three. Um, so I reversed it. I don't have to reverse it. Um, and now it's in the order one, two, three. So let's just go back. That was reverse. It goes three, two, one. If I do that, it goes one, two, three. Screen readers will still read it as one, two, three. Even though it appears it's going three, two, one, it is going to be read as one, two, three. And when you tab through it, if you have links, it will go from one, two, to three. It will not um, change the order. It only changes the order of appearance and of paint order. It will paint in the order that it will be laid out on the page. Um, so then we have row, which is the default. And we have one, two, and three. And then we have row reverse, which makes it three, two, one. Um, Anything else to say here? Writing mode. Uh, still a prefix feature. Let's say you're writing Japanese. There you go. It changes it for you. You don't actually have to. Um, or uh, There's also uh, left to right. It will actually uh, change the, uh, let's cover that in a little minute. So let me show you this example. Remember this example that we had before? So column makes things into rows. And row makes things look like columns. That's the way I look at it. Um, so the, um, the whole page is a, the whole body is a flex item, uh, a flex container. And we have the flex item of the header, the nav, the main area, which has three articles in it, and then the footer. So I didn't really need to. According to this, I didn't really need to declare this as flex with columns because that's the way it would lay out normally, right? But I did so that I can use the order later on, and when it shrinks, I can move the navigation down. Then each one of these three things, the, each one of these articles, is also a flex um, container. So it's a flex container with, that's within a flex item, and that is um, completely doable. Um, so you have the main area is a flex container, and each one of these articles is also a flex container. So in the main area, there's three articles, and they're all 33% wide. And then inside of each article, th that way they're all going to be the same height, because um, a flex item is going to be, by default, it's going to stretch to be the height of its line. So here, all three have stretched to be the height of their line. Then in each one, we have. Um, three items. We have the image, a paragraph, and a button. And what I did is I said, make the button the size it needs to be, and make the image the size it needs to be, and then let the middle part grow. So the middle part is going to take up as much room as it can, and it's going to fill up its whole space. So that's how that one worked. So this is the most complicated slide. It is the ugliest slide. and. It takes like 15 pages in my book to explain, so I'm going to try to do it in one minute. So what we saw was when we were floating out rows, there was a main axis that went in the right to left, uh, in left to right languages, it went from left to right. So there's a main axis in this direction. There's a main start and main end. When you change it to row reverse in right to left languages, it changes the direction of the main axis. If I were to do a right to left language, that would be flipped, and this one would be flipped. And that's fine. That makes translating to going to Arabic super easy. You can use the exact same layout. All you have to do is change the direction uh, property, either in um, you know, dir equals right to left, or direction equals R uh, colon RTL. And then, similarly, I don't know if this image actually covers the yeah. And here we go, just because I like things that look ridiculous. Um, when it has column, 
the main axis is going from top to bottom, and the cross axis is going from uh, left to right. And when it's going this way, the, main ax the cross axis is also going from that way. But if you change the left to right language, it will change the cross axis. So basically, we can now translate into other languages without having to worry about our layouts, because Flexbox will take care of that for us. OK. So right now, we just saw one line of flex items. But you can have multiple lines of flex items if you tell it to have multiple lines of flex items. By default, it will put everything onto one line. We have three values for flex wrap. We have no wrap, wrap, and wrap reverse. So here, we have no wrap in a row. And it's going across, and it's being cut off. And it's actually, it's, it, it's not being cut off. It actually would show if the page was long enough, but it's not. Um, but I could just say wrap it. And there it wraps. And I could say wrap reverse. And notice that it's reversing the wrap. It is wrapping it, but it is starting on the bottom line and then drawing as it goes up. That's counterintuitive to most people would think that would just, but it's actually the wrapping that's being reversed, not the, um, the row that's being reversed. So here, remember when I said min width is by default auto? It overflows. I actually have to set min width auto, and it will try to fit it all onto one line. So there it actually did. It shrank them and allowed it to go down to, to, to one line. OK. So in this one, I've used flex wrapping. Right, because we have cats and we're wrapping them along many lines. Um, and when I shrank it, when your slide deck works, um, notice that it's the height of the tallest one. So this one fits in nicely, and these have extra white space. And this column is much taller than the previous one because this is much taller than the previous ones. And then here, it's as tall as it needs to be to fit the tallest one. So when something wraps onto multiple lines, you'll have flex lines. And it's not something you can actually target with CSS. You can't say, I want flex line number two to have a background of red. That just doesn't work. There's no way to target with CSS. However, the important thing to know is that each flex line will be as tall as it needs to be to fit the tallest item within that line. And then we have properties where we can align the ones that are sh smaller. Here I stretched it, but we could have made them smaller and we could have centered them. Or we could have said, just make them as tall as each one needs to be and have a jagged edge on the bottom. OK, so flex, flex flow is shorthand for flex direction, flex wrap. And this is what the spec authors actually want us to use. Um, so let me just uh, play with this one here. If I do row, uh, before I did flex direction and flex wrap, remember? So here I just do flex flow, and I do row and no wrap, and that's default. And it didn't redraw the page for some reason. Um, I don't know why. Um, that's not actually supposed to be there. That's, uh, my computer is five years old. Wish it a happy birthday. Um, and the uh, hard drive is dying. Um, so if I do column, Uh, I said max width is 100 pixels, and max height is 300. I probably should have made it 500. Oh, I decided to grow anyways. 400, uh, 100. So depending on what the height is of the container, the flex columns will wrap in the direction of the cross axis. So the main axis is this way, and the cross axis is that way. But if I reversed it, the cross axis would be in the other direction. So flex flow is basically flex direction and flex wrap together. Uh, but wait, there's more. Ed Valenti is the guy who did the knife commercials. Um, so, so far, what we've done is we've just basically laid it out. But now let's control the flex items within the flex container. But we're controlling it from the flex container. So these are properties that you apply to the container, to the parent. We have justify content, 
which basically says, how do you spread them out? If they're smaller than the full width, how do you spread them out? So we have five properties. We have flex start, flex end, center, space between, and space around. So here is center, I mean space between, rather. Um, space around actually makes it so that in between A and B, it's twice the size than between the end and A, and C and the end. A uh, space between means put them on the ends and then put equal space in between each one. Uh, flex start is this. Flex, oops, flex end is that. And center is putting them in the center. So um, the navigation that I used earlier, before, I actually let the items grow. We're going to cover that in a little bit. Here, I'm not letting them grow. I'm basically saying, please be 100 pixels. Um, I could just say B1, and then it would be all the way across. OK. Align items is top to bottom. How do you want them aligned? So justify was left to right in the row. If it had been column, it would have been top to bottom. So that's why I showed you that complicated thing with the cross axis and the main axis. Because when it comes, 90% of the time, you're going to be doing row and column. So the cross axis and main axis isn't really going to bug you all that much. But if you're doing reverse languages or if you're um, even doing columns, it does get a little bit more complicated. So align items is if you're doing a row, how to align it from top to bottom. If you're doing a column, how to align it from left to right in a right to left or left to right language. So we have flex start, which puts them on top, flex end, which puts them on the bottom, center, baseline, and stretch. The default value is stretch. Here, I centered them. So each one is the height that it needs to be, because I did not stretch them. The default is what we've seen so far, stretches them. This is 90% of the time what you want your layout to look like. So you don't even need to declare this property most of the time. But here, we've centered it. We could do flex start, right? They're all on the top. We can do flex end. They're all on the bottom. And then there's a weird value called baseline. And that is why I changed number C to have a header that was much bigger. Baseline, if you notice, all of the headers, the base of that text is at the same spot. That's baseline. Never used it. But if you have a navigation a side na a sidebar with a header that is the same as your content header, you might want to actually use that so it looks like they're lined up nicely. OK. That's a line item, so that's from top to bottom. This is where I want to show you visibility collapsed. Um, and I added this slide because I knew I would forget to tell you visibility collapsed. So let's copy this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say C, right? So here is C. When I do visibility collapse, it actually maintains the height of the row, that flex row that it would need to be when it becomes visible again. So if I had done B, it collapses it. It makes it disappear but it maintains the room. It's kind of like visibility hidden. Um, OK. Then we have a line content. So far, what I showed you was when you have one flex line. What happens when you have more than one flex line? How do you align those items within a container? So we have the same values, except for there's no baseline. So you see it's the same things except for there's no baseline in there. 10 minutes? OK. So here, we have these rows. And there's space in between them because I said I want the height of this document to be 2,800 pixels, because I made that up. And I, um, and I put space between. But I could have put space around. And it puts half as much space above it as in between each two lines. Um, I could have put center. And they're all grouped up in the middle. Oops. I think I was on 46. 
OK. If you have, um, basically close your eyes. Uh, OK, there we are. OK, so here it's in the middle. And and uh, the default would be stretch. And it takes up all the room to fill up the entire container. So look how easy layouts are. It's pretty amazing. Um, OK. So we've been controlling the flex items from the parent. You can also control some aspects of the flex item themselves. So we have a line self property. So before we aligned all of them to the top, to the bottom, to baseline, you can do an override just with the align self. So it's, the, it's basically for one single element, um, and it's like the align items override. So here I align item center, and then B, I aligned uh, self stretch. Uh, baseline, uh, flex end. So you see, I'm just aligning that one element. So that's align self. Then I have the order property. So the order property, everything right now has been in the code order. We've been able to reverse. We've been able to reverse from bottom to top, top to bottom. We've been able to wrap reverse. But you can actually take one item and say, you know what? I want to make this the third item. Now, you don't actually want to do that most of the time. Uh, it, the screen readers are still going to read it in the source order. So don't try to use this to alter what your source should have been. Make your source logical. But sometimes you do really want your nav to be on top and then on mobile to be on the bottom, and you don't want to change this, the source order. Um, and truthfully, that's the example I use, and it's not the best example, and I'll explain why in a moment. So the default value of all of order is 0. And then they're grouped. So if you say, like, two things are negative 3, they'll come first. And if two of the items are negative 3, the first one in the source order with negative 3 will come first, and then the second one with negative 3 will come second. And then all of the ones that have no order, because they have the order of 0, will come after that in the source order. And then anything that has a positive number will come after that. So let's uh, take a look at this. So here, these are supposed to be alphabetical. And as you can tell, I put every third one. Um, if you had seen the examples before, there were three different colors of gray. There was uh, darker gray, medium gray, and lighter gray. Um, and they were just basically uh, in, in that order, A, B, C. And here I have C, at, which is a third, sixth, ninth, twelfth. And then I have the second, fifth, eighth, eleventh, and then I have the first, fourth, seventh, tenth, right? So I basically switched the order of whole groups of items by saying every third one give it an order of negative one. If I had given it an order uh, here of negative 17, um, a would a is 3n plus 1 is the first one. That would come first. Um, 5 and then seven, uh, 6. Banana comes first because that is not being hit by order, so it has the default value of 0. So uh, this is a kind of useless way of showing it to you, so let me show you a better way, which is our actual example. Here, in the source order, it says header, nav, main, footer. And inside the main, there's three articles. When I shrank it and I got rid of the other unicorns, um, just so that I wouldn't have to go down the page too much. Here, it has header, main, nav, footer. So what I did, let me just make this a little bit smaller, there, so I can see the whole page there. Um, I gave nav and footer an order of four. Why did I give footer, which is not out of sequence, an order of four? Because if I had given only the nav an order of four, um, it would have come last, because footer now has a value of 0. So that's why I did this. This is a bad example. What I really should have done is, in my HTML, I should have done header, article, nav, footer, and then move the nav up for screens, because for screen readers, I would want my nav to come a little bit later, because I want my content to come first. Possibly. Maybe not. Um, but order allows you to do that. And grouping them, that's why we group them. 
but thanks, I'm good. Okay, so accessibility. The screen reader is still going to read your original source order. Tab order is still going to be in the original tab order. Even if you change the order of stuff, it's still going to tab through. So if you're putting the second tab on the bottom, it's just going to jump. And you all know tab index really bad, um, except for values of uh, 0 or negative 1. Um, and right to left languages, we already covered that. OK. So the last thing that I'm kind of going to cover is the flex shorthand, which is flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. So you do want to use the flex shorthand, but realize it's a shorthand for these three properties. Growing, is the item allowed to grow? So here we have this, right? It falls in this place. Do I allow it to get bigger? Usually, yes. Um, especially, you know, remember those nav elements? I want it to grow bigger. Do I want it to shrink? When we saw everything collapse down to fit on one line, we allowed it to shrink. Generally, that's not what you want to do. Flex basis is what is the basis by which it's going to grow? And I'm actually going to skip to flex basis because it's the hardest one to explain. So by default, you have extra room. And you can either say flex basis of a number or flex basis of auto. So in this case, it's relative. So I said flex grow uh, 2, 1, and 3. So I'm giving the third one three growth factors. I'm giving the middle one one growth factor. And I'm giving the one on the left two growth factors. So it says, how much extra space do I have, and how do I divide it? So basically, because I have 1, 2, and 3, so a total of 6, 1, one plus 2 plus 3 equals 6, I have 6 growth factors. So it's going to give the first one two growth factors, or two parts of it, the middle one 1, and the last one uh, 3. So here, in the top one, it is the extra space because I said auto. So it's auto, it, it says, what is the text that you need? What size do you need? And what space do I have after that? In the second example, it says the basis is 0. That means take everything is 0 widths wide. We're just assuming everything is 0 widths wide. I'm going to give um, 2 six of the page to the first one, 1 six of the page to the middle, or to, uh, the width to the middle one, and 3 six or half, to the last one. Does that make sense to people? This is kind of a complicated thing, and this was the best way that I could think of to explain it. But flex basis is basically when you allow something to grow or when you allow it to shrink, what is the basis for that flex item that you're giving it? So here's another example, and this one actually has text in it. Um, by default, what we've seen is if you don't have any flex uh, at all, if you just don't include flex, there is no flex basis or there is the, the default value, and it takes as much width as it needs to make all three items the same height. Here we're saying, instead of making all the items the same height, um, actually in the, this one, auto, it's saying, make them all the same height, because just basically auto it, and then whatever's left over, distribute it, and here there's nothing left to distribute. Though, um, and this one is saying, give um, two sections, of the 6 to this one, 1, 6 to the middle one. So do you see how that lays out differently when you change the flex basis? So proportionally, I'm going to go back now, here, A, B, and C have a flex growth factor of 2. Because I said flex 2, that means grow. It's the same thing as saying 0 and auto, I believe. Yep. Nope. Auto. As zero. Yep. OK. So it's saying flex growth of two factor of factor of two, don't allow it to shrink, and the basis is zero. And here I say flex one, and that is why C is half the width of A and B. If I said four, it would be twice the width of A and B. If I said six, it would be six times. And it, then it stops working uh, because it actually needs to allow for the the text, the content to work. OK. That's flex basis. So to summarize, yep. Yeah. To summarize, this, you can do a, a layout. I, I don't think I simplified it that, that much, but now at least when you look at this deck later on, because there's no way to teach Flexbox in 40 minutes, 
especially without coding. But this is online. It's at estelle.github.io um, flexbox, or it's the top link on my, um, on my GH page. Uh, if you look at the code here, by default, this is not what would happen. It would actually grow to take up as much room as it could. So how did I make these line up perfectly on the last row? Because as we saw in all the previous examples, the second, the last row uh, grew more. I use the same flex basis, so all of them have the same flex basis. And then the other thing is, I put empty divs here. So this is a little bit of a hack, but it, this is a layout that so many people want to figure out, and they can't. So what they do is they always make things like they always have 12 boxes, or they always add three boxes to the page. But with this layout, you can grow and shrink the page, and it will actually, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, you see how now we're at down to four? I was able to grow the page, and they dropped. And if I go down, it'll still all be nicely lined up. Um, so it's a hack, but it's a, it's a good hack, and I think this is the solution to making um, a, a grid layout, a height where the height is the height of its flex row, but the grid goes all the way down, and, and the last row doesn't look ugly, because the last row looking ugly is a major issue. So um, this book will explain all of this in it's, it's a booklet like 140 pages on the spec. And the spec is 120 pages. Um, but the spec has 60 pages of stuff that make no sense. Um, so I'm not saying you have to buy the book, because everything in the book is actually in this deck. Um, but uh, what I'm saying is the spec is 120 pages. So it's really complex. You don't need to learn everything. But understanding how that flex basis is distributed and how those flex lines work will enable you to actually um, make the layouts that you want pretty quickly. Um, and then understand the nitty gritty detail, that'll take a lot of experience. So hope that made sense, and thank you very much. <laughs>